Welcome back to Banter and to the first discussion today. I'm joined by Casper Llewellyn Smith from The Guardian. And uh, we're going to have a discussion, I suppose a rapid 30 minute discussion about where the music business is right now. It was really interesting. I, I suppose I, I was kind of thinking about this yesterday when I was walking around town and I went up to the Diamond and uh, there was HMV and it's the closing down sale of HMV. They're gone. It's, it's, they're, 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 leaving they're leaving Derry. There's still going to be a couple of shops around. How do you think, you know, that, like, I mean, would HMV be somewhere you reckon that you've been, you've, uh, I suppose, frequented over the years? Not so much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's weird, HMV. It doesn't hold a kind of particular place in my heart. But I, would, I did, I was with a colleague here from The Guardian, and we had a little wander around earlier um, and enjoying Derry, and then saw the HMV, and we thought we'd just pop our heads in there. It's sad, uh, isn't it? And well, I don't think it's that sad. You go in there, and it says it's a closing down sale. Everything must go. I'm thinking I'm going to save some money here and buy some cheap CDs, because I still have a CD plan. I still buy things on CD. Uh, I've been listening to um, quite a lot of David Bowie at the moment, because... Uh, thinking about his new record and that new record sounds a lot like his album Lodger which I don't have on CD so I thought I'd buy a copy of that uh, so I go into HMV they have three David Bowie CDs which is not very many for a record shop when he's one of the biggest artists in the world uh, and then I thought well I'll try my luck at something else um, and I thought what else might I get now I was speaking to people from other voices last night uh, who were telling me that if there's one <laughs> Irish artist I needed to check out, it was Dickie Rock. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and were teaching me um, yeah. all Spit about me him. Dickie. Spit on me Dickie. Um, we were trying this out yesterday. So I thought, I mean, presumably this guy has recorded some records in the course of his career oh, yeah, as yeah. well. Uh, so I went looking for Dickie Rock as well, and I couldn't find any Dickie Rock. Um, and they still had lots of CDs there. So the fact that they don't have the two things I was looking for wasn't a great sign in the first place. Yeah. And it wasn't particularly cheap anyway. I mean, it's still cheaper on Amazon. Um, so... The end of kind of physical retail, it, it's a shame, uh, you know, for real proper record shops where you go and you walk out with stuff. I still buy stuff in record stores. I bought some stuff recently in, uh, in places, um, a couple of shops in London I like, and you go in and you think, what the hell's that? Or they're yeah. playing something on the stereo. But HMV had just lost its way a long time ago. I'm yeah. not, doesn't, I don't mourn it. I feel sorry for some of the artists because, uh, you know, lots of artists still derive a large part of their income from sales of CDs and it's going to make it even harder for them. Mm. But then again, like, while the whole HMV falling apart narrative was, was going on, there's also, I suppose, that story which has which been in the, the music business either for so long about the likes of Spotify and the likes of Deezer and the, the royalties they, they pay. You know, from your point of view, you know, you, you've kind of saying there, you don't go into record shops anymore, you know, you're, you're, you're probably streaming your stuff mm -hmm. or you're buying us downloads. You know, do you kind of think something like Spotify is, it has actually replaced the physical shops by now? Well, I think it's something like 20% of uh, music fans only buy their music digitally now. Uh, and I think of the digital market, it's something like 15% of those uh, are only streaming stuff. Or it's fi streaming is 15% of the digital market. So yeah. it's growing and it's growing exponentially. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's quite good value, Spotify. You can get it for free. There's a few ads, but it's got a pretty, you know, it's got a more comprehensive catalogue than the local branch of HMV. Uh, and it's, it's quite a convincing business model. Uh, it's been interesting to watch the kind of dance between them and the major labels, but I think certainly Universal now, who the biggest label in the world and uh, something like 30% of the market globally, they seem to be embracing it because mm. traditional music uh, companies have lost their business model because of the internet and they don't know what they're doing. They're floundering around. They're trying to find a purpose. So anything that provides a kind of stream of income or a trickle of income is quite good news to them. Yeah. So I, I can see that it's the future. I mean, actually, weirdly, to go back to David Bowie, Bowie said... Uh, I mean, 20 years ago now or something, talked about how uh, music will become like water and it will become like a utility that you turn off a tap and, and it's flowing there and it's everywhere. Now, water, you don't think about paying for it mm. because it's just water. You turn on a tap and it's going to be there. But of course, you pay your rates and it's, you know, there is a cost to it. Uh, but it's just become ubiquitous now. It's weird. I mean, it is weird, you know, for people who've grown up with records divorcing themselves from the idea of owning something yeah. uh, and something that you rent. And it's kind of weird to think, who was it that some big American star was complaining? Bruce Willis uh, was talking about suing, I think, iTunes. You'll remember this then. Yeah. Uh, or, or having a dispute with iTunes because, uh, talking about when he dies, all his music collection yeah. reverts to them and his kids can't inherit it. So, you know, what's he going to do with his music collection? It's, it's a kind of psychological shift and it's, you know, 
that's kind of deep in some ways. Yeah. But it's I suppose it's deep as well in that like bands have to realise that the royalties they're going to be getting from the likes of Spotify, Deezer, Aircom, Aircom Net down down the south from all these streaming services is so low. You know, I mean that was like, that was that great story last year as well, Casper. Like you people kind of going like, well, Lady Gaga got paid something like what was it twenty dollars, thirty dollars for a hundred thousand or a million plays. Do you think I mean, an awful lot of artists have just haven't really got their head around where things are going right now? That some of them are still trying to like put the genie back in the bottle and go back to the way things were in the kind of the eighties and nineties. Well, it's just changing incredibly rapidly. So I don't think anyone's quite got their head around it. I mean, I think that's why, you know, the majors were caught hopping. They could have, you know, hindsight's a great thing, but they didn't see any of this coming, uh, the digital revolution, and mm. were really poorly prepared for it. Uh, I think it's difficult for artists. Spotify is interesting. I mean, they, they've been really criticised for the low royalty rates, and, and not so much that, actually, but the accounting and working out what your rates are. Whereas one of the things people have always quite liked about iTunes is that they've been very good on that, mm. that point. But iTunes itself now, you know, that looked like that was the future. And now that looks incredibly old fashioned. The idea that you were going, you'd, you know, you would buy something and it would still cost you whatever it is, 79p for a, mm. for a song rather than just streaming it. So it's, yeah, it's shifting and it makes it, you know, make, I don't hold any great candle for the record industry. There's lots of great people in the industry, um, but it's going to make it... Uh, for some artists, a bit harder. I mean, that whole landscape is going to shift profoundly, I think. Yeah. Have you found, like, I mean, say, putting on your media hat, but putting, like, I mean, from The Guardian's point of view, that your relationships with the record labels has changed so much? You know, I mean, I've noticed, for example, there's been a couple of pieces lately, you know, by you and by other people, where it says at the very bottom that you've travelled to Los Angeles, courtesy of Warner Music, for example. You know, is that, that's, a, that's a new thing. I mean, are the industry looking for more uh, of that, or is that from The Guardian's no, no, point of view? that's from The Guardian's point of view. I mean, right. I think that's, um, I mean... It's no secret, I think, that journalism is expensive. The record industry has always gone hand in hand with the media by paying for everyone to do everything. Mm. You know, in the glory days of the 70s, for a, an Elton John album launch, they'd fly a plane load of people to the other side of the world. Um, that's that's pretty, that much, pretty much gone Mariana. Now. There was there was, there was the Rihanna thing, which was a kind of fiasco. Um, there was an episode going to Ibiza with James Blunt on a plane to listen to his new record um, with a load of people. But that was the end of that that model, I think. But the, the transparent, the thing at the end of saying that the record companies pay for it is more to do with the Guardian's internal policy of wanting to be transparent about these things and, and being as open as possible about yeah. it. And it's interesting. I mean, it's caused, you know, a bit of ructions with some, some people within the office saying, you know, it looks like we're compromised in some way. Uh, and then the debate is whether people always realise that and it looks good and it's good to be transparent or whether you just keep kind of... Um, yeah. As you were. Yeah. But I suppose like where I was leading with that question was, in a way, like, are you kind of finding that when you're talking to record labels about covering an, covering an artist, mm. that they're kind of like, are they more clued in about different ways of doing things? Like, for example, the Guardian website, it's, it's huge. It's like, it's a, it's a it's a big vehicle. It's got, it's got traffic, a lot of traffic in the States, Europe, way beyond like the UK base of the printed yeah. paper. So a record company is kind of like saying to you, well, how about we do this with a new artist? How about we do more online stuff? How about we do more multimedia kind of features? Not really. A bit. I mean, it depends who you're dealing with. Um, you know, the, the labels as a whole, they really, they change. Um, and it really comes down to individual kind of PRs to an extent or, or people, the management. I mean, it's a really confused picture at the moment. I yeah. mean, we, you know, we're part of that big digital change. So The Guardian itself has gone from being uh, something like the 11th most read newspaper in the UK to being... I think the third, depends if you count the Huffington Post or not, the third or fourth most widely read newspaper in the world. Uh, and we had five million people on the music site uh, or unique users on the music site last month. So that's kind of a big number. 40% of that audience is in the States, 20% mm -hmm. is in the rest of the world. So that's changing really rapidly. Uh, and it's interesting as a journalist because you've got this big kind of box of sweets. You can do anything. It's not just the written word. You can do video. You can do more with pictures. You can kind of create different ways of treating stuff, which is interesting journalistically. It's an interesting way of treating it. Uh, and getting beyond just that model of someone goes off, fly around the world and come back and write kind of this much and print yeah, yeah. and it's this very static thing. Um, the extent to which, you know, people in the industry are embracing that, it, it changes. Um, it changes. I mean, what you, you've always had is, you know, people always trying to assert control. And the, the anxiety, I guess, has been that uh, newspapers become less important uh, because there is more media generally. So, it, you know, in the past you have... You've got your artist up here, you've got this person in a bedroom, and they think, I want to make a record and become a pop star. So how do they do that? Yeah. They have to get a manager. Uh, they then have to uh, you know, get a band together. Sorry, the first thing, get a band together, find a place to work in, find people who can play instruments, right? Uh, then you need to find a manager. Then you need to get signed to a record label. Then you need to go through the media, and the media is Radio 1, it's Top of the Pops, it's uh, the broadsheet, it's the Inky Press, it's the Enemy, Melody Maker, all these papers. 
uh, and then there's the public there. Whereas now you can be a kid in your bedroom, you can make that music with a laptop, which sounds like a band, mm. you can distribute it yourself. You can stick it on YouTube in two seconds. You can put it on SoundCloud and you can reach those fans directly. You can have a direct relationship with them. So you don't need necessarily all those people in the middle. Yeah. So we're all panicking. The record companies are panicking going, Christ, what's happened to our business model? How do we assert ourselves? And we're panicking because the record companies are also saying, but there's other other there's more media, more distribution channels. There's YouTube, there's Vivo, there's Spotify. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's cable TV, there's this, there's that, there's Twitter. So, you know, why do we need you, a journalist, coming in and asking you pesky questions and sort of making artists look bad for, you know, in some serious, proper way and do the proper journalism? So that, that's all of that going on the whole time. Yeah. Can, can you ask what you said earlier on, Casper, about, about the record industry? You said you don't, don't hold any torch to them, you know? And, like, like I look at the record industry as, as someone who worked there in the past, and I, I look at all the mistakes they've made, all the kind of, like, all, like every, every step of the way in the last 15 years, when they should have kind of, like, done something, they just didn't. They sat in their mm-hmm. ass, they counted the money, they counted the profits, that were coming from CD sales. Do you, like, do you, is there anyone in the record industry, you, you said around this couple of people you admire. Give, give me some names of people you think who are kind of like, I mean, doing good stuff. Well, the obvious, the obvious kind of easy answer to that is something like XL Records, which is an independent label. Um, it's an entirely independent label. Uh, they've had a real string of success with lots of artists, but then also signed Adele. And Adele uh, is the best-selling artist in the world at the moment. I think British acts are now counting this, they just had the figures this week, accounted for something like 13.7% of sales in the US. So that's people like Mumford & Sons. I think that's yeah. one of the highest figures ever. Um, it's people like Mumford & Sons. But I think Adele is still about 9% of that on her own, right? Yeah. Um, but the reason XL, XL, it's a really interesting case because XL can turn her into that global star without having to be part of Universal or being part of something else. Um, they've managed to do it off their own back and it really is it's a tiny company it's in Notting Hill in West London the yeah. guy Richard Russell who runs it he's got some quite clever business partners but he's just bases it on kind of his ears I mean it's quite an old fashioned yeah, way yeah, of going yeah. about it they only put out maybe four or five records a year but the records they pick up, put out are really well chosen uh, and artists like them you know so it's a kind of throwback to the days of the early 70s I guess when the heads of record companies actually knew a bit about music themselves and cared about it yeah so to the extent, actually, that he, I mean, he's a, he's a funny guy, but he, uh, he also fancies himself as a record producer. He'd made some dance music hits in the, uh, in the early 90s and then uh, worked with the late uh, Gil Scott Heron yeah. uh, and recently with Bobby Womack producing their records. And Bobby Womack, who is, what's Bobby Womack, in his 70s or 70s, something? Yeah. He's been around the block, right? Um, and started to make this record with Damon Albarn from the band Blur. Uh, and this other guy, Richard, was there who was being told that he was going to be producer. And then it was only halfway through the process, apparently, that Bobby Womack realised this guy wasn't just the producer, he was also the head of the label as well. And that kind of freaked him out and said, you know, he hadn't seen that for 30 years in the yeah, business. Yeah. So some of it's quite old-fashioned. It's, yeah. you know, having confidence in your taste and having a pair of ears. Exactly. And like, you know, you, you said there as well that like XL only releases a certain small number of records each year. So I mean, that you're kind of saying he's got ears, he's got, he understands music, he understands artists, he's artist-friendly, small number, a small number of artists. I mean, I mean, maybe I'm dumb, but my question here is like, why don't other labels copy that model? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's always been a completely inexact science, though, pop music, because it's incredibly subjective. It's, you know, it's based on people's personal taste. The industry's always worked by signing 10 things, throwing at the wall and seeing which one sticks. And yeah. that's great for that one artist, and it's terrible for the other nine. Yeah, um, yeah. And in a way, not much has changed. Although, what's interesting now, I guess is that the big labels are being more demanding of the artists in the sense that they're making them prove themselves in the first instance by going out and creating a fan base. Now, in the past, you'd do that just through touring relentlessly, but now it's as much about your social media profile. So it's, you know, it used to be about MySpace, and that's kind of come and gone, but now it's about how many Twitter followers you've got. Mm. It's about your Facebook profile. It's all that kind of stuff. And they're looking at acts to see how much of that they've got in their bank already and how big a fan base they're bringing with them. And they might have put out a couple of records already or released them digitally. Uh, and they sort of tested the waters before they come in at the next stage and, and really start, mm. you know, mm. chucking the big machine behind mm. it. You mentioned, you mentioned touring there, Casper. I mean, and that's, that's something that just come much more and more, I suppose, important to a band's bank, uh, bank balance in the last couple of years. It used to be that a band would tour to sell the record. Now it seems they're putting out records to tour, you know? Have you, have you noticed kind of like, I mean, from like going to festivals, watching how, watch, watching how festivals have, I suppose, increased in profile and increased in importance? Like, are, is, it, is it noticeable from, you, from your position on the Guardian Music Desk that that live sector is taking over in many ways from the record industry? 
I think it comes and goes. I think a couple of years ago, that's what everyone was saying, that it's all about live music now. Um, and and the market is really saturated. I mean, you can't move from music festivals these days. Um, and so whether that, you know, it looks good at the moment. I think part of the problem also is you, there's, there's so many of them and there's not enough talent to go around. Yeah. Uh, one of the problems you've had is, is how bands develop and it's quite hard to think of big British bands uh, who've come along in the last five years who are capable of headlining a, a Glastonbury or capable of heading, headlining a Reading and Leeds. Mm. I mean, there's Coldplay, but they, that's more like 10 years now. Uh, the band Biffy Clyro, who I really like, they've just uh, been announced as headlining Reading, but that's been 10 years of really hard work and it's, mm. it just takes a long time for people to establish themselves. Once they're at that level, they kind of can't take the foot off the gas. So, you know, you see quite... A lot of instances now, bands, I mean, almost killing themselves. The band Kings of Leon, they're putting out a record every 18 months or something. It's the same record. And it's the same record. Uh, and they're playing all the festivals and they just don't take their foot off the yeah. gas. And, you know, I know there's been problems within that band and it, it doesn't surprise me at yeah. all. Yeah. Because I think people's attention spans, um, I think people's attention spans have been hit by the internet. I mean, I spoke to, I remember speaking to Peter Mensch who is now more famous as being the other half of Louise Mensch, the erstwhile Tory MP, uh, <laughs> dreadful woman. Um, uh, and he's a fairly dreadful man, but he is a manager of several big American bands like Metallica um, and, and some smaller ones here now like Foles as well. But I remember talking to he him. This is, Foles, he? Yeah, this what? was three or four years ago I was talking to him. And, uh, and I said, how, you know, what, how, what's the secret of your success? And he said, the secret of success is to, to have managed bands before the internet, because after the internet, people's attention spans go. And because you can stream stuff, you know, because you're not actually investing in the band by paying whatever it is, you know, even 79p to download the thing, if you're just streaming it or whatever, yeah. people's allegiance to groups is lessening, I think, and that makes it much harder. So it's harder for bands to kind of get up and establish themselves in that way. Yeah. And I think that'll have a knock-on effect on festivals in a few years' time when totally people are just bored. But also, it's also going to mean as well, Casper, we're going to run out of bands because eventually eventually acts like Elton John, Bruce Springsteen and Metallica are going to die. It's, yep. like it's, a, it's a fact of life. They're not going to live forever. There's a piece in the paper in Billboard during the week. Uh, I think it was like seven of the top 12 tours in the States were by uh, Heritage Acts. And when those acts die, you know, uh, like they're not making them anymore, you know, so it's it's going to hit. It's going to hit the industry at that at that stage. You, when you were talking there about bands who, but that doesn't like, bother. Does that bother you? It doesn't bother. I mean, well, I think it, the, it bothers the, me as a Springsteen fan. But like, right. you know, I've, I've seen Springsteen so often at this stage, it doesn't matter. You know, I know, <laughs> I know the shtick. It's a great shtick, and it's why people buy tickets to it. But you're right. But what, but what happens though is that right now is that there's been an industry built up based on these heritage acts, and they, they like I mean, especially the festival, the live fest, the live side. Those big gigs like at Hyde Park, uh, those big gigs used to be at Storm and Castle. They're all kind of like d dependent on those big acts, the Elton Johns, the Springsteens, the Owl, the Owl lads. You know, and when they go that that part of the industry goes so maybe the, maybe what's going to happen is it's going to be the industry's going to be reinvented by debt could be i mean like i don't i don't mind about those big acts going i mean I, i've got a real problem with bands i mean don't start me on this you get me a drink inside me tonight but a band like coldplay can we get a pint um, <laughs> uh, who i can't stand because their music i mean it's really well constructed but it's 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 constructed to be played in stadia you know it, that's what it's for it's constructed for that space in the same way that uh, you know, the great pop music of the 1960s was made for radio mm -hmm. and this new uh, form of communication that came along. And those songs are made to sound really great on the radio. Coldplay are made to sound really great in a stadium. And to me, I'm just not interested in seeing a band like that in a stadium. It just feels boring to me because it feels too knowing. And and there's this whole pretense about it being kind of authentic and, and you know, meant. And it's just it's just a big industry <laughs> yeah, <laughs> do you, do you, I suppose the other thing coming coming from the the live side as well is, and you you sort of like <coughs> mentioned earlier on as well is that now record labels when they sign an act they want a part of the live earnings as well they want they want part of the whole package you're talking about like I mean they're looking for the so, their social media status yeah. they were looking at clout.com probably to see what what their what their reach was you know but they're also looking for kind of like a share of the of the uh, the live 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 fees and it strikes me that like as record labels expand into all these kind of new areas areas in many cases they don't know, know nothing about that we're reaching a stage where like I mean the record industry the record labels that are left are just going like, they're fooling themselves. You told me not to do any homework, but I've done some homework. Right? I'm going to read one thing because I couldn't remember it. <laughs> but this is an interview with Lucien Grange, who's the guy who heads up Universal around the world. British guy, well-meaning, all of that. But he's talking about how their industry has been hit by the internet and it's completely destroyed their business model. It used to be really simple. Uh, they signed acts, they made records, people bought the records. It's a bit like newspapers, right? Yeah. That's all gone now. 
uh, and he's saying part of the transformation, the future of our business is we're driving income in all sorts of different ways from all sorts of different parts of the copyright and content chain. Uh, and that's the interesting bit. It's the copyright and the content chain. You know, before, they didn't really have a huge interest in a lot of the, the kind of ancillary stuff. Um, but increasingly, you know, if you sign with a, a label like Universal, you're signing away all your rights, mm. which the job they'll do for you is to exploit those and squeeze them in, in ways that might make you money. But you are signing away a large part of everything. So, for, I mean, and this is boring, right? But, no, you know, no, for, it means, for example, that at Other Voices... We're live streaming on the Guardian website uh, all three nights, uh, but we can't we can't stream one of the acts because they're signed Universal and Universal. Uh, I mean, this is between other voices, I think, and them and not on us. But we have the same problem with the Guardian. We can't, we can't work filming mm. acts on Universal because Universal insists they retain the copyright and everything. And right. you tell this quite often to the bands or their managers even, this is the point. and they can't believe it. Yeah. And they say, no, no, that can't be the case. And you say, well. Go and, you know, they said, we'll work around it. We won't tell anyone. And you go, well, you, it's fine for you <laughs> to say no Go and check the small print. They check the small print. They come back and they go, oh, you're right. Sorry, we couldn't do it. You yeah. know? And, and it's, it's just a very inflexible policy, that. Because, I mean, I'm, I'm certain that for lots of the bands we're interested in, they're small, they're emerging, we're giving them a platform. It's kind of feels quite straightforward to me, that. Um, but, we, you know, we, if it's our people film it, we're doing it, it feels straightforward to me that it's our copyright. But it's, you know, we can't work with them at all. So it just gets messy and yeah. it's not in anyone's interest then. Well, it's not in anyone's interest. It's certainly, it's certainly not in the band's interest. Do you think in many cases, you know, bands are totally and utterly naive idiots that they sign these contracts You've with... met musicians, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I'm, I, my favorite, I, have, I, have, I have a business model. When, when talking about and writing about music fails completely for me, my business model is I'm going to the t-shirt business. I'm going to get print, t-shirts printed up. On the front of the t-shirt, it's going to be love music. On the back, hate bands. You know, like I mean, band, bands. And it's any musicians in the room. I'm sorry for insulting you, but no, you. Know, Listen, the point that I, I was, meant, I mean, I was being facetious. But the point is, I, th I think if you're a musician and an artist, you know, you shouldn't have to be a business person as well. The whole point, you know, you're offering yeah. something else to the world, and it's in society's interest to protect you from that to some extent. You know. Hmm. Um, oh, I don't know. I mean, I would, I would argue that if a, if, if a band or adults and they're over the age of 18, it's their, own, it's their own concern. Once you're over the age of 18, you can vote. You, you can be arrested. You can be thrown in jail. Sure, I know you can be thrown in jail a lot younger. But, like, once you're over 18, you're an adult. You should know what you're doing, Casper. Well, the music industry has always been, you know, Enabling. exploitative and, and nasty. And they'll take advantage of people where they can. You right. know, that, it's a business. It's why it's called a, a business. It's the music yeah. business. Yeah. Let's move away. Like, like we're, we're rapidly going through the entire music industry right now. So I want to move on to something else. And I suppose it struck... It, 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 it went on my list. It was going on my list anyway, but it went on my list definitely this week when the news emerged about the stool pigeon ceasing publication. And like, I mean, the music media side, and you, you touched on it earlier on, you kind of said record labels will kind of turn around to you and kind of go like, hey, I mean, why are we going to send an album to Alexis Petrus who's going to slag it off anyway if we can kind of like, I mean, talk to other people instead as all these other kind of chains. From your point of view on The Guardian, I mean, there's a, there's a huge number of blogs, websites, all this kind of like ephemera of music coverage out there. Do you think, you know, the, the, a music audience grabs taste towards quality or are, is it in many cases that audience of people who want to find out about music that they're overwhelmed by the amount of stuff that's out there um there's a huge amount of stuff out there there's more stuff than ever um there's just more music than there ever was before and and whatever the travails or otherwise the music industry because people can make it in their bedrooms uh there's just more stuff and a big part of that i mean this is a slight uh, tangential point but a big part of that is i'm really interested in music from around the world which i guess 10 years ago you would have called, called world music but now it's just kids in south africa making hip-hop yeah. on their laptops for example uh, and suddenly all of that's come along as well so there's it's just an overwhelming amount of music um and uh, you know there's an overwhelming amount of media and there's great people writing really interesting about this stuff it's just hard finding it's hard finding the music and it's hard finding the media is that a problem? I don't know. I mean, people on one hand are complaining that, you know, life is boring and, and they used to have to hunt stuff out in record stores. You know, in a way, I, for me, it, it, the pleasure is in spending a bit of time surfing the internet and going around and looking at different blogs and trying to dig out new bits of music here mm. and there as you find it. Mm. So, what, like, what, what, blogs have you, what blogs do you kind of like touch on regularly to find out more about South African hip hop, for example? Oh, I mean, I could list you a whole load of things. Um, things like there's a thing called Ghetto Bass Quake that I like. Um, you know, all electronic music that's resonant and visor. I mean, there's there's lots of stuff out there. Um, and it just requires a bit of an effort to look for it. Yeah. Um, it, you know, you've got to remember, I think in, in one sense, we're just, uh, you know, culturally bloated. Um, something that annoys me is, you know, it doesn't... 
because people always get really upset when I say this, but something like Six Music on the BBC, I just think it's outrageous that Six Music, uh, you know, there's this huge campaign to save it. Yeah. It's like people my age who've grown up in music, we don't need to be spoon-fed this stuff, you know. We can easily go off and find all that stuff out there with a little bit of effort ourselves. So that money, I think, should be spent on local radio around the UK or, or on something which isn't just more kind of culture for people who've got plenty of it already. I think yeah. there's loads of stuff out there if you're prepared to put a bit of effort in and, and try and dig it out. Yeah, but in, in many cases, a lot of music fans have just get, given up in many ways because there's so much stuff out there. You're talking about a cultural bloat. You know, that, that amount of new music that's out there, they've just given up. They've seen the stop sign, they stop. Well, the problem is it's not, you know, there's, I suppose there's a question of whether music is going to be the big cultural motor no. force that it was for a large part of the 20th century. Uh, I was rereading a bit of... Um, uh, what's I can't remember the name of it, the, the 17 or something. It's a book by Bill Drummond, who yeah. used to be um, in the band the KLF, who were also famous for burning a million quid. Uh, and they had that huge run of singles with the KLF, and they kind of effectively walked away from the music industry. And he's someone who thinks about it a lot and writes about it a lot and is very entertaining. Uh, and, you know, he says he thinks that it's sort of the end of that historical period when music was, was so important. Uh, and I can see that, those big kind of identifiable cultural trends of you had the hippies, you had the punks, you had, you know, even rave. Um, since then, there's no, not been any one real strong youth movement that's come along and sort of put its foot down because it, it's all everywhere now. And mm. all of those things are instantly accessible and everyone can discover stuff for themselves. And it, it, all that culture has spread and become more diffuse. It's much harder now for something to kind of really stamp itself and to have everyone in the country, for example, sitting up and taking notice. Yeah. And it's because suddenly, you know, I remember when uh, with the Magister bands in the early 90s, you know, the point at which uh, Happy Mondays and Stone Roses got on top of the pops, that was just so exciting as a kid because you never saw those bands yeah. there. So the fact that they did it uh, on the one place that everyone saw music and talked about it was incredibly exciting. Whereas that stuff's just ten a penny now. There's, there isn't Top of the Pops. It's everywhere and everyone is kind of, it's just a bit of a mush now. Yeah. Final question and thank you very much for your time, Casper. And thanks for the good rattle through the music, <laughs> through the music business. I mean, for someone who said you, you, this wasn't your forte, you've done really well. Um, but I, I suppose that like, it could kind of, I want to bring it back to something we kind of talked about earlier on, just in terms of record labels. Does it strike you as unusual at the moment that record labels are still signing bands to huge lucrative uh, uh, contracts? You know, that like there's bands, like I mean, there's a couple of bands playing here this weekend, like Soak and Little Green Cars who've been the subject of or are, are the subject at the moment of large chases from record labels does that strike you as kind of like totally wrong headed or are you kind of going like that's for the proof that the music business done with their ass from their elbow um, well I think the, the main thing is there's still a lot of money in the music industry I mean the comparison is always between you know I make the comparison between newspapers and their once great industries largely vilified a uh, whole business model has been destroyed by the internet whereas unlike newspapers where it's actually it's quite tough out there there's still lots of money in music you know um, we've just seen the the breakup of the collapse of EMI uh, because it was mismanaged but in comes the Russian oligarch uh, with very deep pockets and buys Parlophone from them um, and that's as part of the breakup um, paid cash for it I think I can't remember what the figure was but it's some huge amount yeah. of money uh, and if you've got a successful act, you can still make a huge amount of money from it. So it's it's the same principle still applies, I guess, that you know no one knows anything and they take a stab in the dark. And if there's an act that everyone wants and they're talking about, they're still going to be able to invest in it. And and you might strike lucky. You might have a Mumford & Sons. You might have an Adele. Okay. The final question. And you mentioned earlier on, you know, you, you, you mentioned uh, kind of like uh, a, 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 the South African hip-hop act or whatever. If you were to kind of like say, to tell people here, one act they should check out, one new act they should check out. Oh no, no, no. I, and I'm going to talk for a bit now so you can yeah. think about it. Uh, <laughs> so like, like an act, not, I'm not looking for an act that's going to be next Beefy Clyro or Mumford the Sons or that, but an act right now, a new act that people here might know that, that they, that's exciting you right now that they should check out. Who would that be? That's um, enough time for anyone to think so, about so, so, I mean, an example of the way in which all this stuff is, is fractured is, is is every year in the, at the Guardian at the end of the year we ask all our writers and people who occasionally write for us quite a large number to come up with lists of their favourite albums um, and then one of my colleagues said we actually need to do this as a proper democratic vote I'm just saying look we'll just pick the one I like most and we'll stick that at the top he's going you can't do that and in fact my favourite record of last year didn't even make it into the top 50 because there was such a wide choice of things and that was a record by a band called The Very Best uh, they are two guys. One is a Swedish producer who now lives in a block of flats overlooking the Olympic Stadium in London, and the other guy is a Malawian singer who 
they met in a junk shop in London. Uh, the Malawian guy now overstayed his visa and isn't allowed back into the UK, and there's a bit of fuss around that whole thing. Anyway, they make this kind of future-sounding... I don't know what you call it. I'm really bad at describing music, right? I'm hopeless at it, and I find it very hard to describe the noise they make. It's sort of pop music, and it sounds very modern. Um, it's really approachable. You know, it's a kind of... If you like Graceland's by Paul Simon, you might like this. It's kind yeah. of... It's, it's fun, and it's upbeat music. Uh, it's electronic. It's mixing that tradition, though, with something which sounds really traditionally... Uh, you know, I was going to say African, but it's probably not African. It's Malawian. Uh, so that, the very best. And the album is called... It's uh, MT MTM, TMK or something, which stands for more to Malawi than Madonna's kids. Casper <laughs> <laughs> Lorenz-Smith, thank you very much. <laughs>